Hello, welcome back to um, Utter Randomness, my podcast. Hello, hi. Uh, if you hear fans in the background, it is too hot for this. <laughs> so sorry for any kind of fan, 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 fan sound you might hear in, um, I don't know, however long this podcast is, because it's too hot. It's very, very hot. So I've been wanting to do this particular podcast since March and I've been putting it off because I think I was concert high (laughs) so I've been wanting to put I've been wanting to do this for so long and I finally got the I don't know courage to finally go ahead and go let's do this and go ahead and sort of basically start it and let's get the introduction out of the way before I um fully start, I guess you can say. So, welcome back. I'm Lulu, your host. You're listening to Our Random's podcast, and we're doing a spotlight artist. So, in March, and uh, if you've been listening to my podcast in the last, uh, since March, <laughs> you would have known that I went to a concert, and it was my first real concert, and not a tribute band concert. Nothing wrong with tribute bands. I love tribute bands, but this particular band I've been wanting to go for for some time and they were here and thanks to a really good friend I got to go with him and it was a blast I had so much fun and I I wanted to do the podcast at like two in the morning and I put it off and basically wrote down all of my feelings and thoughts and I recently reopened the notebook to sort of look at it and go yeah no this is not podcasting material because it was a jumbled mess I had no cohesive thought which is usually me I never have a cohesive thought or like a train thought a a train thought (laughs) a cohesive line of thought it's always just kind of a jumbled mess but because it was two in the morning and I was very um coming off of a concert high and i really 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 didn't want like concert amnesia to set in so i like wrote everything down and i was just we can do this and no we cannot do (laughs) this so the band i'm talking about if you guys did not take a look at the title screen wherever you are listening to is tool and i have been a fan of tool since probably my middle school years and i got I got to go and it was so much fun and they were here and I was like oh my gosh my they are a type of artists that are performance as well like it's it's such an experience that I don't see many newer bands do um, unless you're into k-pop music I guess because they're also a performance type of band and if you're there just for the music then by all means good for you i'm the same way and i was just i'm just saying that not a lot of of bands are performance bands and these guys are they take their art and their music very very seriously and it's what made me fall in love with them because of their unique style that i at at the time the music i was into didn't really do i just remember going i would love to see them live and obviously they've been playing since the 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 80s 90s I never thought I would get to see them in concert because a lot of older musicians don't do a lot of concerts anymore or they do very sporadic concerts and Tool their members are also a part of like many other works and other bands and so I never thought I would see them in concert and plus tickets are massively expensive uh if you've been to a concert recently they're they're pretty up there in price but it was a privilege and an honor to go however Saying that, uh, I really wish I did the 2 a.m. Con- 2 a.m. post-concert podcast to really like just get a jumbled mess out. Anyways, I've listened to Tool since middle school, as I said before, and my first introduction to them probably wasn't a probably probably shouldn't have been my first song. It was Sober. I just remember I loved this song and when I got older I could appreciate it more because I understood what the song actually meant which if you have listened to their song and looked at their works and not just their music but their artistry as well 
um, their songs are really, really poignant and still fall in today's kind of what the world falls into today. And I, it was one of those things like, I love them so much. <laughs> They're one of my favorite. And I, I, I was so happy because I was able to get a hoodie too. And unfortunately, if anybody knows, uh, merch is expensive, unfortunately. And I was able to get one thing. So I like saved up a little bit of money that I had and was able to get one thing. And I was just enamored pretty much the entire time, the entire experience. And I was really, really privileged to go with the person I went to because we share the uh, sort of similar energy where we just like to listen. I'm very much a listener. I'm not the type of person that will stand out and rock out and everything like that. I really just love listening and it was my first real concert and I just wanted to experience it as much as possible so I'm like watching what's going on what they have going on on screen which by the way if you've been to a tool concert they prohibit any kind of recording media whether it be video for photographs unless it's pre-approved I guess you can say for like press and stuff they prohibit it they have uh, people going around and they'll kick you out and, and everything like that until Maynard the main singer goes you can now Bring out your cameras and in our case they he turned around and said no flash because flashing is annoying so I only grabbed a few shots, which I'll, I'll show if you are watching this on YouTube which will eventually get there. I'll show on YouTube if I might upload this to Spotify because Spotify now has a video thing now, but if you're just listening to this, I will have it up as soon as possible, but no pictures of me, just pictures of the stage. It was really neat. They have, they have what the art, the art that they use can be quite unsettling if you're not used to it. And a lot of the art is actually can be made, is made by, um, the members and another person that I cannot remember but the art is is very much a part of the band uh, it's what drew me to because they do a lot of stop-motion for their music videos and I kind of lost my train of thought I forgot where we started on that <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> anyways uh, I guess it was just it was so much fun and I wish, I wish I, I, I'm really regretting not doing that 2 a.m. podcast now because I'm trying to get all my thoughts together and I'm actually doing this pretty much off the top of my head. I'm not, I don't have a script in front of me. If you want an article, go over to my articles. Obviously that will be in, the link will be in whatever description box you find. And I'm actually listening to them right now, actually, as I, as I record this podcast, I think it's Latteris that's on right now. And they did not play that. I don't think they played this song during their during their concert. But the two songs that I never anticipate for them to play because if you are into concert going and whatnot, there this concert was actually a anniversary type thing for their Fear Inoculum for their Fear Inoculum uh, release, which is probably their most recent release. They um. Yes, I, Fear Inoculum was their most recent, recent release. And then they had Opiate Squared re-recorded and re-released in 2021, March of last year. So they played a lot of their songs from Fear Inoculum. So when I found that out pre-concert, I actually was like, I actually hadn't listened to a lot of Fear Inoculum from that album. I obviously listened to Fear, the song itself, and it has such a unique sound with the the bell I want to say the the um, increasing bell song and that was a a pattern throughout the concert but the two songs that I did not anticipate for them to play was two of my favorites which was sober which I mentioned before is one of my favorites and the pot which I believe both of them come from their undertow album oh I want to say it came from their undertow album I know Sober came from their Undertone um, album. Oh, my brain, my brain, my brain, my brain, my brain. I want to say both of them came from Undertow, but don't quote me on that. I might have to look that up and probably put going, no, uh, the pot does not come from Undertow. Yeah, Editor Lulu here. No, 
the pot does not come from Undertow, it comes from 10,000 Days. Regular scheduled back right back to the podcasting, Lulu? I know for sure Sober comes from Undertow, from their Undertow album, which is which is um, one of their, I think it was their second album, because Opiate was their first album. And Tool is a progressive type of band. So when they released Undertow, it was during the height of like alternative rock and grunge rock. And this was their first full album release, Undertow. And, re- and they released songs that were not a part of their Opiate EP. And this was during the time when censorship for music was very, very big. I'm not sure how to describe it. I mean, they still have censorship censorship, censorship stickers that go on to certain uh, albums and stuff like that. And you'll see that, you know, around. That's still a thing. But this was when Tool was starting to release music regularly, I guess you can say. Which, by the way, they don't release music regularly. (laughs) They release music whenever they pretty much feel like it's finished. They basically challenged the censorship guys, I guess you can say. And I'll get into that a little later because that was a huge thing in the 90s. So when they released Undertow... Like I said, they released censorship labels, and this included their album or their the artwork on the album um, being sold at none other than Walmart. Uh, but despite this, despite that the fact that they were getting censorship labels and censorship for their artwork, and thanks to their touring schedule at the time for like Lollapalooza, they were able to get a gold certification from the R- RIAA for undertone and platinum status sober which is one of my favorite songs if you've not listened to i always if if you're creeped out easily i do not suggest watching the music video because it's stop motion and it is slightly creepy but to get the full experience for the song sober i do recommend to go see the music video and it's still on youtube and whatnot they got best video by a new artist for their title track sober because of the direction they decided to take with their music video and it was stop motion and claymation i forgot the claymation and it's such a unique take on this and this is pretty much how they got to be known for their progressive work and the type of style that they tend to lean towards and not just their a lot of people say their work is unsettling when you they look at it or maybe as I mentioned before creepy is the word that comes to mind a lot but to get to full experience I really really recommend to go see it so following sober They released their next title track, which I guess is their B-side track, Prison Sex. (laughs) They're once again a target for censorship. So this song, if you have not listened to it, is part of the undertow. It dealt with child abuse. And it was primarily written written by Adam Jones, who is the guitarist for for, um, Tool. And he approached it by saying, and I quote, that it was a surrealistic interpretation now, many journalists actually applauded the band for the lyrics in the music video. Once again, they took a more creepier style with the music video. Uh, it's not... It's kind of start motion, stop motion kind of claymation. Um, but others really didn't like the the song. They thought the music video and the, and the song was inappropriate. And actually MTV, and this is when MTV actually played music videos, stopped actually airing the video after only maybe a handful of showings. Now, their next lineup, actually, I totally overskipped Opiate, but Opiate was an EP. I should probably tell you who the band members are. So, say main singer is Maynard James Keenan, or just Maynard. Guitarist is Adam Jones. Bassist is uh, Justin Chancellor, but he replaced uh, Paul Damore, I think sometime in the mid 90s. And drummer is Danny Carey. Now, originally, the band name Tool wasn't actually going to be Tool. It was going to be Lacrimology, Lacrimology, I think it was. And I don't know why that was a choice. I did some research on the actual, like, before Tool became Tool. And I never, there's not much on that. However, the reason they did, that they settled on Tool, and I quote from Maynard, he says... 
it so people could use us as a catalyst in your process of finding out whatever it is you need to find out or whatever it is you're trying to achieve. So literally they were hoping that tool would become tool for, for individuals, that they would use their music as a tool for processing and everything. And after two years, they took two years of dedicating their time to practice, um, they finally signed with Zoo Entertainment. And in 1992, they released a tool's first work called Opiate. Now this was an EP and, this, and it included songs such as Hush and obviously Opiate. And this is where I come up with the censorship stuff. So Hush was a song dedicated to the Parents Music Resource Center um, and their censorship of music. So this, these are the people I was talking to about earlier. They're called the, or, or the PMRC. They were formed sometime in the 80s. And a lot of people were like, they had a war on music. It's kind of like the war on video games, if you think about it. Now, the PMRC disbanded on its own sometime in the mid, mid to late 90s. However, the parent, like the parental warning and advisory stickers that you see on music, today there's there they they were basically the start of it so after the release Tool actually began touring with Roland's band Fishbone Range Against the Machine White White Zombie and Corrosion of Conformity and it was considered to be a positive review actually so we're going to we already did Undertow so Anemia and Olivia so I always mess this one up Solival I think it is now as I mentioned before, um, Paul DeMora left Tool, and it was totally and completely amicable from what I could find. He wanted to pursue other projects, which included actually showcasing his range as a musician, and he became a part of Lusk, the cover band Replicants, Fearsome Engine, and he actually ended up composing music for TV and music uh, movies, and he was replaced by Justin Chancellor, who is still a part of Tool and was a former member of Peach. Now, Anima, and I know I mispronounced that earlier, I said anemia, but Anima came out in 1996 and was their second full-length album. Their title track, like a lot of their title tracks, received limited airplay and it was called Stink Fist. Now, this song is five minutes long um, they wanted it to be shortened and the lyrics altered. Now, when it was played on air, it was changed to track number one because of its... Stink Fist has a lot of offensive connotations. So, I might end up actually have to put a parental warning on this myself. Now, fans were livid. They were so, so, so mad at the strong censorship that this particular song got. And responding to this basically backlash, Mike Penafield um, of MTV's 120 Minutes expressed not only regret over the changes, but explained, but took the time to explain to fans and viewers why this song was being censored and why this song was being sort of um, targeted for all of this. Now, Anima actually had Grammy nominated artwork. This is where we get into the artwork, specifically. Now, there is a artwork that became the album artwork itself. And this particular artwork was called The Smoke Box. And it was by Cam de Leon. And it was his collaboration with Jones. Now, this piece, which um, de Leon actually does a lot of their artwork. And it's super nice, actually. He was approached by Jones regarding this particular uh, art, the smoke box, which would later actually end up being played on big screens during live events. And they do this a lot. They'll put a screen in front of, depending on where you see them, there is two types of screens. One in front of the band that's sort of like a mesh type screening, and then one huge projection type screen in the back. Now, uh, De Leon went on record later saying that he was surprised at how powerful it was. 
project it that large. After that, Adam had the idea to use the lenticular jewel case to animate it on the cover of Onima. Now, if you get the old cases, they're they're slightly old. They're slightly lenticular. Um, they don't make them that way too much anymore, but I digress a little bit. Now, he, they went on a two-week tour following the release of, release of Onima, and they landed in various parts of Europe, including New Zealand and Australia, before returning to the U.S. in time for Lollapalooza in 97, where they were the headliner, which was awesome. Anna became Grammy Award winning and appeared on several best albums of 1996. Before being certified triple platinum by the RIAA in 03. Now, in 98, they joined Ozzy Fest in the U.S. and were co-headliner act before Ozzy Osbourne himself. Mm, 98 wasn't a good year for them. They faced several lawsuits because of their contract, quote-unquote, contract violations and loss of commissions. The now obsolete, they no longer exist, uh, Zoo Entertainment, um, a successor did emerge during this time called Volcano Entertainment, Entertainment sued Tool, citing contract violations. Because Tool was looking at other contracts, which in my opinion, bands are going to do. When their contract is over, I see them looking at other contracts to explore their options because they want to do more, they want to do less, they want to do things that they've been wanting to do for a while, but let's skip over that a little bit. They end up settling out of court and they actually end up having another lawsuit from their then manager, Ten Gardner, who had been dismissed. Now, fans in 1998 became very worried that Tool was disbanding because of all the lawsuits, because of everything that was happening. Maynard, remember when I said that Tool has a lot of other projects, a lot of other works? I'm going to get into that right now. Now, Maynard is a part of a perfect circle with longtime guitar tech Billy Howardell Jones joined the Melvins with Buzz Osborne, and Carrie joined Dead Kennedys. With the band very, very obviously split up with other projects, they became increasingly worried that Tool would soon announce their disbandment. I can understand their worry. Um, thankfully, those anxieties were quelled with the release of Salival which was released in a box set which included CDs and DVDs. Yes, DVDs still exist. Yay. <laughs> um, a cover of Led Zeppelin's No Quarter and a live version of Peaches You Lied and a revived version of old songs were included on the CDs and the DVDs. The DVD included music videos of four songs and plus, plus bonus video for their song Hush, which, which was released in Opiate. In 01, Tool announced their new album, Systema and Philol, and it would include 12 new tracks. Now, <laughs> Napster. Now, Napster was a huge file uh, file sharing site back in the early 2000s. They were overwhelmed with the release of these songs from the album, and it turned out that it was totally bogus. A month later, Tool revealed that the album was in fact called Laterless. And originally, and the originally released track list was a ruse, which is actually really cool. They later released um, this this release, I should say, would solidify their footing within the art rock and progressive art uh, art rock scene because this is when they're showing what the what the band actually is giving to their fans. Now, um, Rolling Stones went on to say, and I'm quoting this, drums, bass, and guitars move in jarring cycles of hyper howl and near silent death march. The prolonged running times of most of Ladderless's 13 tracks are misleading. The entire album rolls and stomps like suit lake purpose. If you have not heard Ladderless, I highly recommend it. This became highly successful, reaching number one on the US Billboard 200. They also received their second Grammy Award for Best Metal Performance from their song Schism, and once again, Schism, oh my goodness, if you've not seen it, I know I'm going to be saying that again, and again, and again, but I do recommend you go watch their music videos. I think this is one of the few, few bands where I'm like, no, you really need to 
go watch the music video if they have a music video to really really enjoy what they have to offer and what they're offering in in just general this is one of the few bands where i'll be going no you really need to go see them or see the music videos if you can if you have the chance to go see them yes i recommend go see them as well so following the release they once again went on tour in 01 to 02 after the completion of this tour um Maynard went back to a perfect circle and ended up touring with them tool wasn't completely inactive um, at all, they released the double vinyl four picture disc edition of Lateris at this time, too. 10,000 Days uh, was their next release, and fans were really, really, really skeptical when they were. when Tool announced this release, thanks in part to the prank that they pulled with Lateris's release. So, when pre release information was being disseminated and released, most people actually believed that it was fake rightfully so um however when the album was leaked the rumors that were surrounding said album release just were gone they dissipated pretty much overnight um even though album sales were decent it received less unfortunately less than favorable reviews um compared to tools previous release with lateris now with the less favorable critic reviews of the album Tool still, still went on tour, and they kicked their tour off with Coachella in 06. Schedule-wise, it was very much set up like Lateris. Unfortunately, Kerry actually had an accident where he tore his biceps after playing with his girlfriend's dog, and he ended up actually going under, uh, he actually ended up going into surgery in February, and Tool actually resumed touring back in April. Vicarious is the title track for um, 10,000 Days, and I am very sad to say that I've not watched the music video for Vic Vicarious, but it's a very interesting song. And it was nominated by a Best Hard Rock Performance, and 10,000 Days won Best Recording Package at the 49th Grammy Awards. Fear Inoculum, which is what this whole concert was for, um, pretty much kicked off a lot of things, actually. So in 2012, Tool was touring across US, across the US and Canada for their Tool Winter Tour, and they actually ended up going to Japan for Aussie Fest, Aussie Fest Japan, uh, not Aussie Fest, Oz Fest Japan in 13. Both Carrie and Jones actually both went on record explaining the reasons behind their delay in their fifth full album, which would have been Fear Inoculum. The bands had hopes that they could release the album in 2015, but pointing out that they actually didn't want to rush any kind of things and, and just didn't want to meet, didn't want to rush into the deadlines. Now, 2015 came and went, and 2016 was on the horizon, and it had them go back on tour in the U.S. with no album. 2017 saw Maynard rec record the vocals for their fifth album. However, the album wouldn't be released until or wouldn't be released in 2017. Uh, Maynard revealed that the album was about 90% finished at this time, but Carrie, in a separate interview, said that the album would definitely be released in 2018. 2018, once again, Kai came and went, and there was no material release. During an acceptance award at the Icon Award for the Mental, Metal, Metal Hammer Golden Gods Awards, I've not seen this, so I have no idea what this is. Um, Maynard said that they would be releasing music soon. Not, there was no date, just soon. He would further um, go on to say something on Twitter that recordings had ended months previously, actually, and they would be releasing it soon once again. This came as two songs being performed at the Welcome at Rockville Festival in Jacksonville, Florida. They were called Descending and Invincible. Invincible. Fear Inoculum would re wouldn't be released until 2019, and it became their third number one on the U.S. billboards. In January 20, um, 2020, they won Best Metal Performance for their song Temptist at the 26th, the 26th, 62nd Grammy Awards. So like many performers, in 2019 2020 they had to cancel their 2020 concerts because of the 
ongoing and currently ongoing global pandemic. They took this time for, uh, they took this time to actually go on hiatus, which actually I read a lot of bands actually ended up doing during the pandemic. They took the year or two to really recharge their batteries and meet fans full force when they were able to and things opened up again and um, things of that nature. So they had hopes of reconvening in the future with an EP, actually, in which they were hoping they had more freedom to create because they were no longer tied down to a record labor. Lab labor? Label. Um, 2020 saw Jones, Chancellor, and Kerry become being featured in an in a instrumental song for The Witness. As I mentioned before, this is when Opiate was re-recorded and released for Opiate Square in March of 2021. And actually, at this time as well, it was announced that they were working on new material for a sixth studio album and that they even had music left over from previous recordings. But the band didn't know how long it would take them to make. Now, Tool likes to take their time with music in general. And I actually appreciate that because they actually, it feels like they actually sit down and, and, and write songs and, and try to figure things out as a band and so on and so forth. Um, Tool has named actually several bands that were huge influences uh, on them, such as King Crimson, Melvin's, Passion, Pink Floyd, and the Sex Pistols. One of their biggest elements that sets them apart from other bands, at least in my opinion, is their work in visual art. I've mentioned this earlier that not only is Tool a rock band and music musicians, but they're also performance artists. And it's really neat to go see in general. And you actually might hear my cat again, so apologies. And not only do they incorporate whatever art that they find um, for their, their albums and their videos, but they also use this art in performances and merchandise. Over the years, and they're 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 pretty they're a pretty established band. Tool has won a um, one AMFT award for Temptist, one Billboard Music World for Fear Inoculum, four Grammy awards for Anima Schism, Ten Thousand Days, and Temptist, and one iHeart Radio award for Fear Inoculum. Their musicality, and this is where the band kid comes out. Um, they like to layer different time signatures, rhythms, temples, tempos, sorry, words. They really like using um, polymeters. And this is when music consistently falls in and out of sync by playing with rhythms and signatures where they, where they layer these pretty much. They're also known for using really, really unconventional, in, unconventional, not unconventional, unconventional time signatures with their music. I hate odd time signatures, and this is what they love to use. It's 7854, those types of time signatures. So if you're a band kid or are some kind of musician, do exactly know what I'm talking about. Because when you sit there, you have counting face, I guess you can say, whether you're sitting there and trying to kind of count. And that, that really sets them apart, too, because of their play with these very odd time signatures that pretty much everyone else hates, but they love. Uh, Tone-wise, I'm not good on tone, so I might be missaying this. Um, Tone-wise, they're, they're more like melancholic um, and they're very centered. I'm not sure if I'm portraying that correctly, uh, but they're, they're it's like focused almost on hypnotic almost, especially when you listen to them and Maynard's tone, for, for example, because he's the, the um, main singer. But when you listen to them and listen to the way they layer the music, including how Maynard layers himself in the song as well, um, it can be very powerful, very hypnotic. And I hope I'm explaining that properly <laughs> because tone is not my forte. I can tell you about rhythms and signatures, but tone wise, let's just say I'm slightly tone deaf <laughs> when it comes to my own things, um, which is why I'm not a singer, but yes, I've, I know I've mentioned this very early on. I've listened to Tool 
um, since middle school, and they've been a pretty much one of the most constant bands outside of maybe Linkin Park um, in my playlist. I grew up, these are the two bands that I pretty much grew up with, that I pretty much love, that are, their songs are, are, are a constant, a very constant mix in my playlist, whatever playlist I'm listening to. And they really, my music tastes really haven't changed much since my middle school days. Um, I mean, <laughs> don't get me wrong, I know you guys, uh, when I do spotlight artists, some of the spotlight artists I pick are musicians that I constantly listen to today, but when I look at my playlist, some of the songs that make it into my playlist would not be music that I would have listened to in middle school. <laughs> Um, but however, Toll is just one of those constant reminders that my, what my middle school days were like and, and no matter the mood I'm in, I'll, I'll find a song that I love to play with them. And I think Toll's, if you're, if you like rock music and you're a new, I say new, but you don't listen to older rock, um, bands or progressive bands or alternative bands or grunge, grunge bands. Um, these are one of those ones that I do regularly recommend people listen to. They're, to me, their music feels quite timeless. Um, but before I fully wrap this up, it was a super real honor to be able to go see them live. <laughs> um, and I say that for good reason. Uh, I, don't, I don't talk about myself personally usually when I do these podcasts, but I am actually very, I'm chronically ill. I'm chronically special. <laughs> and sometimes my health doesn't let me enjoy these types of adventures, these types of adventures, be able to go to a concert. Let me just say my anxiety was so high that I probably could have made myself sick. <laughs> Um, because all I wanted to do was go, like, I try to keep myself as healthy as possible. In the midst of COVID, by the way, uh, to be able to go to this concert, I wore a mask when I went. Um, I didn't care if I looked weird. I did not care that, you know, people were, like, 99% of people were not wearing masks because mask mandates had been dropped for inside venues. I did not care. Uh, I was going to go um, mask upped and lots of hand sanitizer just to go and fully enjoy this concert. When you're chronically ill, um, the flu can lay you out pretty quickly. Um, and that's what I was worried about. And I actually, after this concert, I was actually, I ended up getting sick maybe three or four days after that. And I think a lot of it was because I was just so worn out. And I was so tired. And that's kind of why I wish I did the 2 a.m. podcast. Because I was sort of rearing from that energy from the concert. I, it, was, it was such an experience. And I wish I could adequately put that into some words. That would be able for you to fully understand what this experience meant to me. And I don't think a lot of people will understand. When you're... When you have to be aware of your body and yourself 24/7, even in sleep, like this isn't this isn't just this isn't just you know when you're awake, but even in sleep. And I had known that I uh, that the that me being able to go to the concert I think was like in December or, or November. Um, not only was my health declining, but I had a very close family member who was undergoing um, treatment and, and things happen, unfortunately, as much as you don't want to admit them. And I just, I, to be able to go, to be able to fully enjoy this as much as possible, to be fully, and sorry for my cat, <laughs> to be fully, be able to be fully present and enjoy it and just kind of just sit there and listen to them. And I got to, they got to play pretty much two or three of my favorite songs, which I was not expecting them to play at all. Uh, cause it's when I, I went online to see what their lineup sometimes looks like. Not all the time. Uh, I was not expecting this song, these songs. They played, like I said, they played the pot and sober and 
when they say that they it's a, it's a rarity that they play these songs they do mean it because they can't change their lineup very often because of the artwork that they use um, to to well do the performance art part of the um, performance of the, the concert so when they say that some of these songs are a rarity they do actually mean it and I just had such a blast and I wish I could do it all again and it would still probably feel the, the like the first time. I've read a few times that people who have gone to their concerts a number of times and it's still an experience and there are a finite amount of bands, performers, artists that you can actually say that for and I think Tool will forever be one of those ones that kind of will always be like it's still an experience it's still fun to do it's still fun to go it's not a oh I saw them once and I'm done I'm not gonna see them again I would love to see them again but I think I'm going to wrap this up I don't know if this will be released this week I don't even know what this week's um so originally I think I had um Serenity and Firefly for a Under the Radar. That might change to a Midnight Binge for Moon Knight, I think. Um, that will be released, I believe, on the 24th. But I'm not sure if it, it's going to be a... Um, it's going to be down to the wire for either Firefly and Serenity or a Moon Knight. I might end up with a Firefly and Serenity one because that will be a multiple parter. Uh, and I think we'll either release this this week or next week I tried to keep it one per week so either it be a actual voiceover podcast or a an article so I'm not 100% sure if I'll also be releasing this on the 24th it might be released on the 1st oh it's July already um for articles I think the next one will be maybe another spotlight artist I was thinking G friend your know, jingle um or tomorrow on it for um a midnight binge but i'm not 100 percent sure because those are articles for podcasts this is pretty new so it'd be this one or another one but i'll have to sit down and actually do it <laughs> so it's either it's, it's going to be a fight to the death on this one i'm not sure which is going to be released it's either going to be here on tool hi or an article for Firefire and Serenity. And like I said, that'll be a multiple parter. Be on the looks out, look out for a website that I'm currently on working on. It's currently in the works. It's taking me a hot minute to do because once again, I am the only person doing this. I'm super excited for the reveal of everything. Hopefully it's coming along nicely. And I say that because I'm just like, it looks fine, but I have no second opinion. So woohoo! Not only for the website will you be able to find these podcasts, but you'll also be able to find blogs. And when I'm not currently creating blogs, blogs, blogs and podcasts, I do actually certainly hope you have enjoyment with what I have planned and what I have to offer. Um, I think we're going to end it there. Please consider supporting this podcast in any way that you can. That includes listening to this. Follow me on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. On Instagram. Hello. I'm on TikTok. Check out the rest of these podcasts and or the articles if you prefer actually reading and sitting down like I do. And we might have a currently reading. I know. My brain just went currently reading and I've got to sit down to do that. You can support this blog slash podcast at Buy Me A Coffee, Patreon, Ko-Fi, or right here on Anchor or Spotify, wherever you are listening with um, supporter listening. Um, until next time.